Good morning! My name is Roger Edwards and I'm the Marketing Director of Protection Review. And on behalf of everyone on the Protection Review team, I'd like to welcome you to ProtectX4. So whether you're watching this live today on June the 17th, 2021, or you're watching this later as a replay, I'd like to thank you so much for tuning in. I'd also like to thank our event partners, iPipeline, Hanover Re, and Legal and General. Thank you so much for your support. As always, the format of Protect X4 is seven speakers, each speaking for seven minutes. Hot topics, controversial topics, topics that create debate. And then after the speakers, we'll be joined by two panel guests and together we'll debate the issues raised by the speakers. As always, we'd like Protect X to be really interactive. And as always, we've chosen Twitter as the means to achieve that interaction. We'd like to use Twitter as a chat platform where you can ask questions and give your opinions on what you're hearing. All you need to do is include the hashtag ProtectX2021 in any tweet, in any reply, and any retweet. In the last few Protect X events, we've managed to trend on Twitter for that hashtag during the morning. So let's try again today to achieve that trending position on Twitter. So remember, please use the hashtag in everything that you tweet. ProtectX2021, that's ProtectX2021. And before we get into the speakers, I'd just like to tell you about a little financial advisor competition that we're running during the session today. Now, during one of the speeches in Protect X4, you're going to hear the answer to the question that I'm about to give you. So it's in one of the talks. And the question is, what percentage of business loans are backed by a corresponding protection policy? So what percentage of business loans are backed by a corresponding protection policy? Now, what we'd like to do is invite the first financial advisor to ad answer that question on Twitter, obviously after the point where the answer is given in one of the speeches, and that person will win John Lewis vouchers worth 100 pounds, but will also at Protection Review, make a charitable donation of £100 to the charity of your choice. So we'll look out for that answer during the sessions. And remember to include the hashtag in your potentially winning tweet. Hashtag ProtectX2021. So let's welcome our first speaker. From Working to Wellbeing, please welcome to the virtual stage, Dr. Julie Denning. Hello, my name is Julie Denning, and today we need to talk about why long COVID demands acceleration of existing workplace wellbeing aspirations and thinking about whose responsibility that is. So if we think about what's currently happening in the marketplace, we know that the insurance industry is really focused at the moment on helping integrate benefits into overall wellbeing strategies for organisations. And it's about helping employers to really join up their thinking and understand the offering and what's available out there in terms of their wellbeing propositions. Um, and that's a still kind of an ongoing piece of work, which is great. But when we think about in the context of long COVID, we maybe need to kind of expand our frontiers and kind of think about things in a slightly different way, mainly because of the nature of long COVID itself. So if we think about it as an illness, so it's very difficult to predict who's actually going to develop long COVID symptoms. Um, there's been some some understanding in the literature of what that might look like. And at the moment, broadly speaking, it's more likely to be women. Um, it's of a working age population, people who are really, really fit prior to contracting COVID-19. But that's not the absolute. And we know that it can affect um, um, older people too. And we know that it can um, affect people with underlying long-term health conditions. So it's going to affect a really broad population of individuals. So we need to think about well-being in that context of a, of a really broad reach. 
But we also need to think about it as an illness itself. And it actually has three kind of main clusters, if you like, of symptoms. And those three are physical, cognitive and psychological. So we take the physical first, just to explain a little bit. So people experience crashing fatigue. So not just a little bit of tiredness, full on fatigue. And that can actually come in waves. And it's been kind of referred to as corona, the corona coaster um, of, of a symptom. And people also experience breathlessness and that's breathlessness on exertion. So they might have difficulty even going upstairs, for example. Um, but they can also experience aches and pains in their bodies. Um, and often at, at previous injury sites, you get a, a further inflammation. We also have people experiencing cognitive difficulties, so in terms of concentration on tasks, in terms of uh, their memory, in terms of like tip of the tongue experiences, but also um, struggling with like a brain fog. So when they're really trying to get involved in detailed tasks, they find a fog kind of mist kind of comes down. They find it very difficult to focus. And then we've got the psychological features. Now, one of the most important ones is adjustment, um, psychological adjustment to a new condition. So if you imagine three or four months ago, five months ago, someone might have been very fit, very healthy, multitasking, multi-juggling, doing all sorts of different things, and suddenly they're incredibly tired, they're breathless, they're feeling really fed up, they get a brain fog. That's a really big transition for somebody to adjust to, and there's going to be a psychological impact of that. And often what we are seeing is like incredible frustration and anger and pushing through and, and, and experiencing boom-bust cycles. But we also know that people experience low mood and anxiety as part of long COVID. So any well-being kind of program and strategy needs to bear in mind those three core features in terms of uh, a delivery and intervention and support. But we also know, you know it's going to affect the workplace in some way and it's going to affect um, you know, a small business just as much as a very large corporation. So any well-being kind of strategy needs to, and thought needs to be taking that into account. But also think about what's being masked in the current kind of work working environment. So we've got a lot of people working from home. Now, the people we work with can find it much easier to work from home and manage symptoms than it is, for example, to do an hour and a half commute there and back to the workplace or to manage symptoms. You know, at the moment, people might be able to have a rest during the day. That's not going to be possible in, in an office environment, for example. But we also know people on furlough. There may be, um, you know, an issue there in terms of you know, people are managing their symptoms. They're technically at work, so on the payroll, but they're not actually working. And how are we going to help those people get back into the workplace? And a well-being initiative needs to be bearing in mind not just keeping people well at work, but also helping people back to work after a period of illness. So we need to be bearing in mind these sorts of features. So. To manage long COVID and its complexities really will require a very integrated, very personalised programme because, of course, you know, we might have the, the, the diagnosis of long COVID, but actually it affects people very differently and you've got to be aware of those individual differences. So we need a very personalised programme in amongst all of that. So what else do we need? We also need a, a programme that is um, based on early intervention. We need a programme that goes, that goes beyond um, having like mental health champions or wellbeing champions. They may be part of the picture, but we probably need some clinical input in there as well. Some healthcare professionals who can make an, an assessment and an understanding of what's going on and can then recommend or even provide the intervention themselves. So we're thinking about a multi-layer kind of intervention here as well in terms of wellbeing initiatives. But we need those to be supported by line managers. So employers need to understand what the role of their line manager will be and enabling them to become increasingly confident and equipped to have conversations with people who've got long COVID. But in amongst all of that, we need a wellbeing proposition that's underpinned by a very solid framework of agencies involved. So that would often involve HR, it involve occupational health, it could involve health and safety, it could involve benefits providers, uh, people providing PMI and, and group income protection, for example, also rehab providers, wellbeing providers and intermediaries and kind of joining up all of them, connecting together those different agencies in providing this workplace wellbeing strategy and initiatives. But we've got to think about whose responsibility is that. And the, the insurance industry is starting to think about this. And a lot of IP providers are now providing really strong working uh, working and well-being propositions for their clients, which is great. And these often now do include long COVID programmes, helping people to stay at work and get back to work. But what about the nine in 10 um, workforces and the, the UK workforce who 
aren't actually getting that sort of service, aren't getting those uh, benefits, if you like. What about them? How are we going to reach that group of people? It's a very large group of people we need to try and help and support. And how can we help, for example, intermediaries to have um, a different sort of conversation with their employers and their clients to understand what sort of offerings are out there, what can be provided, how can we have this truly integrated offering, how can we think about a holistic service and maybe probably do a little bit of lateral thinking because what an SME will need is different to what a big corporate will need. So we've got to think about sort of that um, right ecosystem, if you like, for um, aspirational wellbeing programmes. So my question to you is, who's going to take responsibility for that? So should it be the insurance sector? Should it be intermediaries? Should it be wellbeing providers? Or actually, should it be something that's managed in-house by the employer themselves? It's over to you for discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Julie, for that thought provoking talk and our next speaker is from the Chartered Insurance Institute so please welcome Dr Matthew Connell. We need to talk about how we talk to the public about social care. The last 18 months have raised some pretty fundamental questions about social care. The pandemic has taught us how fragile our care system is it's taught us how fragile our own mental well-being and mental health can be. And most of all, it's taught us how important it is for us to maintain contact with the people who are most important to us in a close, everyday way. This raises fundamental questions about how we organise and deliver and fund care. But it's one thing to recognise that fundamental questions have been raised, and it's another thing to do something about it. So at the CII, at the end of last year, we asked a thousand members of the public what they do to prepare for care. And most importantly, what they've done to help their parents help for, um, prepare for care uh, and, and the things that have worked for them. And what we found is that a significant number of people are doing tangible things uh, to prepare for the challenges of later life. So around 40% of people had helped their parents set up specific savings and investments. And a similar number of people had helped their parents make adjustments to their homes, again, to make them uh, more, more, more accessible, more usable in a future that, that required care. So a lot of people are, are thinking about this uh, in a very practical and tangible way. Of the people who had done these, um, for savings and investments, uh, just over half the people who had, who had set that up with their parents had said that that was a useful thing to do. And it's probably not surprising that it wasn't much more than a half, given all the savings traps and means testing that surrounds the care system at the moment. Um, significantly more people found that making adaptions to the home uh, was, a, was a useful thing to do. Around two thirds of people said, uh, that they, they were glad that they'd done that. But the thing that was most useful, according to the people who'd done it, was simply talking about care needs to the wider family. And yet, only a quarter of people had done that. Three quarters of people hadn't. And we asked the three quarters of people why, why they hadn't done that. And yes, about one in six of them said, well, it's because it's none of my family's business. It's up to me to decide what happens in the future for me. But far more people came back with, with, with answers like, I just haven't got around to it yet. I've been meaning to, but I haven't got around to it. Or I haven't formulated my own plans yet. So I don't want to talk to people about their plans until I know what my plans are. Or simply, I don't know how to start the conversation. What we know is that the one thing that we as a society can be doing to prepare for the challenges of care and later life is the one thing that three quarters of us aren't doing. And that's mostly because we don't really know where to begin. So what does this mean for financial services professionals? Well, first of all, I think it means that it's a bit of a stretch for us to expect to people to engage with lengthy advice processes or products and solutions aimed at funding personal social care in later life. If 
people aren't even doing the first basic step of talking about the issue. And what we know from work by organisations like Age UK is that the best way to get people to start acting and preparing for later life isn't to intimidate them with the whole challenge, with telling them that they need to do long-term financial planning. The best thing is to help people take small steps. So with that in mind, what, what kind of small steps can people take to start getting their house in order? Well, one thing that people can do is just think about their access to the online world, the increasingly important online world, access to things as simple as photos. If they weren't able to access that anymore, what would the people they trust need to know to access it for them? And then beyond that, what do people have? What resources do they have? What kind of financial products do they have? Bank accounts, savings accounts, investments, insurance. And how can they bring all this together in a way that people can access if, if they can't get to this information themselves? And then finally, who do they trust to make decisions once all this, deci once, once all this information has been marshaled? If, if people can't make decisions for themselves any longer. And then potentially towards the step to setting up some sort of power of attorney, some sort of formal arrangement for people to act on their behalf if they can't act for themselves. And I think it's very important to take these gradual steps because often the journey into care isn't one that happens overnight. Sometimes it is because of a stroke or a serious, serious health crisis but often the road into care is, is more gradual and it's around um, smaller challenges, around answering letters, answering emails, getting someone in to do cleaning, getting someone in to look after the garden. And if we can help people navigate these smaller challenges, then that's the point at which financial services professionals can start to earn the right to talk to people about the more fundamental issues around personal care and funding personal care in an environment that people want to plan towards, in an environment in which they have the companionship still of the, of the people who are close to them and they can retain as much of their own independence and the lives that they love so much for themselves. So ultimately, that's what the Care Challenge is about creating the small steps towards building confidence that earns us the right to talk to the public in an intelligent way about their growing social care needs. Matthew, thanks very much for your talk. So what do you think of the session so far? Don't forget, let us know what you think on Twitter and remember to include the hashtag ProtectX2021. That's ProtectX2021. Our next speaker is the Executive Chairman of Square Health. Please welcome to the virtual stage, Dr. Bipun Vinayak. Hello, I'm Bipun Vinayak co-founder and chairman of Square Health Group. By background, I'm also a consultant surgeon. In this presentation, I will talk about the misleading and confused message that has been given to the public about rapid lateral flow tests for detecting COVID-19 infection. I, along with many other doctors, am keen to raise public awareness about the limitations and efficacy of the currently used rapid tests, circumstances in which they should be undertaken and how negative results in particular should be interpreted. Before I dive into some of the pitfalls of rapid tests, let's consider some of the issues and how government policy is using these tests as part of a mass population screening programme for asymptomatic individuals. The key issue is that one in three people with COVID are asymptomatic and therefore a low cost self-administered test with many results available in 30 minutes is to some extent the utopia for COVID testing. And since early April, government has been urging asymptomatic people 
to take two rapid flow tests every week, a policy that I believe is misguided, unlikely to reduce transmission. And it should be noted that the government quite correctly recommends symptomatic patients to continue to observe self-isolation and undertake a PCR test. These rapid tests are now ubiquitously available. They can be ordered online to use at home, at work, or from local pharmacies. The government claims that this is to prevent outbreaks and support economic activity and return to normal life under an ambitious program called Operation Moonshot. The government has championed the use of negative rapid tests to enable people to visit relatives in care homes, return to work or university schools and open up sporting events uh, and other events such as weddings and funerals. It is based on government policy rather than the medical evidence. This is driving wrong individual behaviour, giving people false reassurance and therefore putting them and their contacts at risk. It also has the effect of distorting true statistics as self-reported results from asymptomatic people are already skewing nationwide data on test numbers, positive rates as well as trends are all becoming harder to interpret. And lastly, it is an unjustified waste of valuable healthcare resources and budget. So let's examine the evidence. In later part of last year, a study was undertaken in Liverpool, whereby mass testing was carried out in an attempt to test the city's entire population. Approximately 20%, 25% of the, of the population were tested, with the vast majority having rapid tests, some having PCR tests and have some having both. In this study, where both tests were carried out, it found that 60% of infected asymptomatic people were not detected by the rapid test. And this included 33% of people with high viral load and therefore the most likely to infect others. The UK regulator, the MHRA, has authorised the uh, use of lateral tests, but subsequently has raised concerns that government's mass testing programme is stretching the authorization it granted. The MHRA has emphasized that negative results should not be used as a green light for people to change behavior and has asked people to continue to be cautious. Although mass testing using rapid tests may be helpful in picking up some asymptomatic cases, which may otherwise remain undetected, their use is limited to certain specific circumstances and only of benefit if they are accompanied by clear information and high quality tests. Despite the evidence, the government continues to claim that te the tests detect 77% of positive cases, but fails to acknowledge that this figure comes from laboratory scientists and experienced nurses running the tests on symptomatic people. Another mass testing program was undertaken on students in Birmingham, where it was found that only 3% of those who would have tested positive on PCR were picked up by rapid tests. The extent of the confusion created by the government messaging is now illustrated by many examples of people who have symptoms, but choose to take the lateral flow test, and if negative, they interpret this as confirmation that they are not infected and therefore do not need to self-isolate. This false reassurance is having the perverse effect of driving up infection. The current policy also has a high direct expense running into many billions and not in substantial indirect costs of diverting resources from core services such as education, care of the elderly and delivering vaccination program. It is essential that the government develops much clearer messaging on the risks of negative results. 
and the information should be revised to make it very explicit that the currently commonly used rapid tests have extremely poor sensitivity, which means that many true positive cases will not be detected, especially when used in a community setting and self-administered by individuals who do not have any symptoms. The policymakers need to listen to the medical profession which is urgently calling for more responsible use of these rapid tests in a way which is supported by the clinical data. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bipon, for that really quite hard-hitting talk about COVID testing. Our next session is a little bit different. We've actually got seven young financial services professionals, each giving us an insight as to why they decided to take a career in the protection industry. They all work for AIG, so please welcome to the virtual stage to introduce those young financial professionals, Vicky Churcher, the Intermediary Director of AIG. We need to talk about how we encourage more young people to build a career in our industry. Some of you have heard me talk about this before, as I'm actually very passionate about it. There are various different sources in the press noting how many financial advisors are currently authorised. It's hard to pinpoint an exact number, but all sources agree that there has been a significant drop in the last 20 years, and again, more recently, post-COVID. It's essential, therefore, that we encourage more young people to build a career in this industry that we all know and love if there is to be a bright future. In a moment, and keeping in the Protect for X's tradition of sevens, seven young, very talented people just starting their careers in financial services at AIG Life will briefly tell you their story. I hope it inspires you to encourage the young people you know and gives you some ideas of how you can facilitate simple entry points for young people in your firms, as we have done at AIG. Hi, my name's Henry. Hi, my name's Michaela. Hi, my name is Kevin. Hi, my name is Tom. Hi, I'm Lauren. I live in Rygate, just down the road from where the AIG offices are. Hi, I'm Emily and I left the University of Sheffield with a degree in geography. I really enjoyed the degree and the university life that came with it, but I just wasn't sure what I wanted to do with it afterwards. Hi, my name is Talgit. My first choice of career, like many young boys, was to be a professional footballer. However, I've always been a realist and decided that's probably not the right career choice for me, as my skills are not as good as the Man United players. So that gives away who I support. When I left college, I was just keen to get a job and start earning money. I needed somewhere local as I was living at home at the time, so I applied for many positions and was lucky enough to get an interview at AIG. Like many people in my year at school, when I left, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. So when I saw a job advertised at a local supermarket, I applied and got it. It was great experience, but I knew I had more to offer, and I wanted to build a professional career. So I actually turned to a family friend to ask them some career advice. They themselves worked in the industry and asked if I'd ever considered financial services. Now, it wasn't something I knew much about, so I did do some further research and it did seem very varied. I had also, of course, heard my parents talking about life and critical illness policies. I am really new to the financial services industry. I only joined AIG in March this year. I completed my degree in September and always liked the idea of finance. I went to Tesco's whilst looking for the right job. Before I joined AIG, I knew absolutely nothing about financial services. Before attending an open evening, I remember frantically Googling who AIG were and looking people up on LinkedIn. I went to Sussex Uni and I graduated with a master's in management and finance. I really enjoyed my time there and wanted to build on the skills I'd already learned after I graduated. I'm always keen to learn and would one day like to end up as a financial advisor and hopefully own my own business. I was delighted when I was given a job in a customer services team. And whilst working here, I saw how interesting life in the industry could be. I went along to one of the AIG open evenings to find out more about working in the telephone sales team. It sounded really interesting. And after a series of interviews, I got the job. It couldn't have been more different from working in a supermarket. Although there were lots of cakes at both. My second choice was to work in a professional environment and have a job that offered me a good career path. However, most of the jobs I saw advertised were in offices and for personal reasons, I really wanted the flexibility to work from home. Like many people who had just left uni, I was worried about finding something I wanted due to COVID. When I saw the post for the job at AIG, I was really hopeful that I would get it 
And it's, as it sounded like a great opportunity, I did get it and I was right. There is so much to learn, but I am excited by the opportunity and the chance to develop my career at AIG. I worked in a sales support role, organising events. And after two years, I actually left AIG to pursue an opportunity in the events industry. Having spent 10 months there, I quite quickly began to miss the clear professional career path I had set out for myself at AIG. I joined the AIG Life Sales team in January of last year, just before COVID struck, and I've been working really hard in my spare room ever since. I actually used the lockdown time to study for my Level 4 Diploma in Financial Advice. I took my final exam in April, and I'm delighted to say that I passed and am now fully diploma qualified. I'm told that's quite an achievement in a little over 12 months. I made the decision that this is where I wanted to build my career. So I applied for a job in a sales team and was delighted when I was given a chance to expand on my experience. I worked in the phone team for just over a year before applying for and getting a job in the quality team, working in the field with advisors to improve their persistency and business quality. It was very timely when I saw the LinkedIn post to work at AIG as they were trialling out telephone account managers working from home. Now, this was long before COVID, which now, of course, means a lot of businesses offer that flexibility. So I applied for the job. I asked more questions in the interview than I was asked myself, but I got the job and I now support some of the large networks in the industry. I saw there was a position in the sales team, so I applied and was lucky enough to come back. And it was the best thing I ever did. I love talking to brokers and helping them find the right solutions for their clients. The confidence I gained and the pay rise allowed me to be more independent. The best thing about my job is that I still get to speak about football to some of my advisors on my panel and we have banter about each other's teams. But more importantly, we get to speak about protection, which is something I'm really passionate about. I am also working towards my CF1 exam, which is hard, but actually just doing it is really teaching me a lot about the industry. And I'm really keen to get my certificate in financial planning before the end of the year. The thing I'm looking forward to most is building some great relationships with the advisors on my panel. I'm now leading on an important large AIG sales project, and I couldn't imagine doing anything else, except maybe presenting to you live in a non-COVID world. I'd recommend this industry to anyone. Many of my friends thought it sounded boring at first, but now they can see how many friends I've made, how much I enjoy my job, how many opportunities it has given me, and of course, my nice company car. Upon my first year in the industry, I would highly recommend it to anyone looking to build a long-term, stable career. And if you know anyone that would like to talk things through in a bit more detail and just know a little bit more, then feel free to let them know that they can add me on LinkedIn. My name is Tom Price. Thank you so much for the team at AIG. Isn't it good to see young people getting excited about the protection industry? Now, there's been a lot of talk over the last few years about artificial intelligence. Some of it fact, some of it fiction. Here to talk to us about why now is the time to consider artificial intelligence in protection is Nick Milinkovic from McKinsey. So please welcome Nick to the virtual stage. We need to talk about the transformative impact of artificial intelligence. AI is reshaping industries around the world and life insurance is no different. However, we are far away as an industry from realizing the full impact that AI can have on how we run our business and how we serve our customers. Today, I'm going to share three trends that make us believe that the time for AI is now. I'll share three things that leaders are doing to separate themselves from the pack and explain why that gap is widening, not shortening. And the third thing is I'll give you three ideas for how you can accelerate the launch and the scale up of the artificial intelligence transformation in your organization. So why do we believe the time for AI is now? There's really three reasons. The first is that we live fundamentally in a more digital world than we did just 18 months ago. And that means that while we've been able to pivot mostly all of our internal and customer facing processes onto some part of a digital backbone, it provides the foundation on which we can embed artificial intelligence more deeply into how we run our businesses. The second is that consumer expectations are rising exponentially and they're expecting more from us. While many customers are fine with the one and done nature of life insurance, many are looking to us to help them engage more deeply in their protection and their expectations for how they want to engage with us are now being mapped onto financial services, retail, and other industries that have already undergone a much more fundamental customer experience transformation. And so customers are expecting more from us and want to engage with us differently than they did 
very recently in the past. And the third is that there is an exponential increase in the amount of data available about individuals. Some of that is because there's a ro more robust external data environment than there was previously, but a lot of that is, to to, is having to do with the fact that customers are willing to share more information with us than they were in the past. While numbers vary by survey and geography, what has consistently been shown is that customers are willing to not only share more data, but share data on a frequent and ongoing basis with their insurance carrier, provided that the insurance carrier is providing value back to that customer beyond just the delivery of a product. And so the more fundamentally digital backbone, the rising expectations and willingness to engage, and the exponentially more deep data that we have about customers all tell us that the time for AI is now. We do a piece of research every year at McKinsey that I find fascinating, where we ask insurance carriers around the globe about their analytics program. And amongst other questions, we ask two. One is, are you getting yet the full value out of your analytics investments that you had hoped? And nearly everyone says, not yet, or it's a little underwhelming. And we ask, are you investing more next year than you are this year? And nearly everybody says yes. And so what we as an industry have yet to figure out is how to scale these investments and see the returns. All but a handful who are doing this well have struggled with this. And so what separates them from the pack? In our view, there's three things. The first is that they're focusing on a basket of use cases. They're not focused on only one part of the enterprise. They're focused on the entire enterprise and looking at a portfolio of artificial intelligence related investments. The second thing is that they are deeply embedding AI into the way that they run the business and rigorously tracking impact. So it's not a tool that maybe some people use and some people don't. It's deeply rooted in the way they run the business and they're rigorously tracking impact so that they can prove value and fund further investments. And the third is that the management team is focused on business problems and bringing the right set of people together to do that and are fundamentally AI literate. And so what that means is that there's a management team that understands the power of AI, understands how to use it, and has brought together the resources in a cross-functional way to solve these problems beyond just the traditional silos that we see in most institutions. And so doing each of those three things, the basket of use cases, deeply embedding and focusing on impact, and bringing together the right people to solve the challenges are what we've observed the leaders do that has consistently allowed them to start outperforming their peers. And so... You know, we've worked with thousands of institutions across different industries on how to scale um, their AI programs. And we believe that there is an irreducible set of capabilities that are required to deliver an at scale and enterprise grade AI transformation. And every institution has a slightly unique way of building these and a slightly unique transformation journey depending on their starting point. And there are, but there are three things that most companies can do in their early stages, which is where many life insurers are to really begin accelerating and reaching the status of some of those leaders that I talked about before. The first is that they take a domain-based approach. So they don't focus on a single problem, a single use case in one process. They really think about sales and distribution or underwriting or service. And they think about how AI can fundamentally transform the whole domain and build use case roadmaps and teams and backlogs around the domain. So the first is to really understand and be business-backed and create a domain-based approach to how you're going to deliver AI into the business. The second is that they focus on agility in terms of product development, launches, funding. They bite off small pieces and don't make massive platform investments in data, technology, other things, but rather bring the capabilities together and deliver business impact in rapid cycles with a cross-functional team. And as they do that, they iteratively improve the quality of their data, the quality of the technology, the AI literacy of the organization while delivering business benefit. And so rather than thinking about this as a huge transformation with big investment, they separate out and create small, fail fast type of archetypes that they then deploy across the domains across the organization. And the third thing that to do at the beginning is embed change management from day one. The number one reason why AI struggles to achieve its benefits is that the people who are supposed to use the AI decide not to. And so it's not deeply ingrained in the way that you do business, whether it's a claims adjuster, an underwriter, a salesperson, someone in the back office, there's a tool that's sitting on a shelf somewhere that has been struggled to be adopted by the people who should be using it the most. And so really thinking about change management from day one and embedding how the front line is going to use 
not just use, but understand and deeply adopt this new technology is critical. So again, there's a, a number of tailwinds that tell us that AI, the time for AI is now and that many life insurers are just at the beginning of unlocking the value. There's a number of things that leaders are doing that are starting to distance themselves increasingly from their peers. And there's then three things that we think each carrier should contemplate and start doing now in order to start catching up and getting the full value from their AI investments. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nick, for giving us a better insight into the subject of artificial intelligence. So let's move on to the subject of business protection. Please welcome to the Protect X stage, Zanel Simbanda from Towergate Health and Protection. We need to talk and we need to talk about business protection. We need to talk about the complexity of business protection, whether that is real or perceived complexity. We need to talk about the underinsurance gap that exists in the business protection world. And we need to talk importantly about our duty as professional advisors, our duty of care to our customers, our duty to demonstrate that we understand their businesses, we understand their risks, and we understand and can advise on the solutions that they can put in place to mitigate those risks. And business protection is one of those solutions. Now, another reason why we absolutely need to have the business protection conversation ourselves is quite simply because if we don't, then we run the risk that somebody else will have that conversation with our customer. And when they do, there are no guarantees as to the quality of the conversation that will be had or indeed the quality of the advice that will come from that conversation. Now, this is not the only reason why we need to talk about business protection industry research and all the information we have access to tells us that in 2020, for example, uh, businesses borrowed at four times the rate that they borrowed money in 2019. Now, naturally, you'd expect that with such an increase in business borrowing, you would see a correspondingly astronomical increase in business protection policies or business protection advice. But that's not the case. And we need to unpack the reasons why this business borrowing has not been followed by an associated fourfold increase in business protection policies. Now, one of the reasons quite possibly could be the perceived complexity or the real complexity of business protection and navigating that world, especially for advisors that may be new to business protection or new to protection as a whole. Um, but what we do know is that the statistics uh, from the consumer protection sales or personal protection sales, and certainly the claims statistics that we've seen published in recent months by the insurers and by the ABI, all tell a story. And what that story tells, what that story says, is that there is a greater awareness of mortality and a greater awareness of morbidity amongst the population as a whole. So it's very likely that when you broach the subject, if you're not already comfortable with it, when you broach the subject of protection, you are very likely to be pushing against an open door. And especially when you broach the subject of business protection, you are very likely to be talking either to a business that understands the need for risk mitigation or is acutely aware of mortality and morbidity. So we need to get started. Now, the other thing that we know, the other important point that we know from uh, business protection and, and the gap that sits in insuring businesses and ensuring business continuity is that of all the business borrowing out there, legal and general state of the nation report tells us that of all the businesses that have some form of borrowing, only 20% have a corresponding protection policy in place. Now, that is either a huge underinsurance gap in the remaining 80% or they have other solutions in place. Is it likely that the full 80% have other solutions in place? 
unlikely. What this more than likely points to is the underinsurance gap that I've already mentioned. And that is a gap which is our responsibility as advisors, our responsibility to work with insurers and our responsibility as the industry as a whole to ensure that we are highlighting that risk, we are raising that awareness and we are doing something about helping businesses mitigate that risk. Now, like I said, business protection is perceived to be a complex subject, but our responsibility and our duty of care to our customers does not go away because of the perceived complexity of the problem at hand. In fact, it's magnified and it will only get bigger the longer that we leave it. So we need to get started. Will it be easy? Who knows? What we do know is that if we don't get started, we run the risk that somebody else will and we run the risk that we will be called into question when our customer has a claimable event that we could have knowingly highlighted and knowingly put solutions in place or helped them to put solutions in place to mitigate. Now, business protection is a complex area. And again, this complexity can be a perceived complexity or a real complexity, depending on where you're standing. However, what doesn't go away and what isn't as complex is um, identifying those risks and where one is not comfortable putting the solutions in place or writing the business protection or giving the advice, then there is a professional network of business protection connections, a, a network of advisors with whom various different businesses can and should connect to make sure that we are not walking past our responsibility. We're not ignoring the situations that our customers are presenting us with, but we are helping them to find solutions either by being the advisors ourselves or by identifying a network of professional connections in business protection advisors who can help uh, mitigate those risks for our customers. Now we know that business protection is very much a trusted advisor conversation. So if your customer already trusts you to look after their wealth, to look after their personal protection needs, to look after their mortgage, whether that's a personal mortgage or even a commercial mortgage, then it's very likely that they will either trust you to write the business protection or advise on the business protection yourself, or they will trust the professional connection that you recommend. And again, the research that we have at our fingertips in this industry tells us that of all businesses who took out business protection, 73% did so following the advice of somebody they trust. And that is usually somebody who is an advisor in another part of their business portfolio. So we really need to have the conversation. We need to get started. And ultimately, we need to have that conversation with our customer, because if we don't, then somebody else will. Thank you so much, Zanel, for those insights on business protection. And our final speaker today has had a career of 34 years working for Legal and General in the protection industry. And he's going to share with us today his views on the future of the protection market based on the experience that he's developed over his career. So please welcome to the virtual stage, Mr. Richard Caterley. Hello, Kevin's asked me to reflect on my 33 years at Legal and General and the industry as a whole, which is quite a tall order in just seven minutes, I think you'll agree. He's also said I can be as controversial as I liked uh, now that I'm not restrained by the corporate guidelines that I'm so used to. Well, you'll be glad to hear that A, I'm not going to give you a comprehensive look back at my career, however exciting I think that might be. Uh, I think it'll probably blow the pants off you. Uh, and my old colleagues at Legal and General can rest easy as I'm not about to reveal any shocking big secrets. Firstly, it wouldn't be right to do so. And secondly, I don't think I've got any. Did I just hear a collective sigh of disappointment out there? Sorry about that. Anyway, what I did want to do is simply reflect on two things I feel are holding us back as an industry, from being even better than we are already. I have made no secret of the passion I have for what we do for the clients who buy into our products. And for those advisors that day in, day out, put their clients in a more informed position about their protection needs. 
There are countless advisors out there that who do a far better job than I could ever hope to do. And I've made a career out of listening to these experts and then passing on their pearls of wisdom, their techniques, their lines, their processes to other advisors and hoping that they'll adopt just some of this training and put more of their clients in a more informed position about their protection needs. Interestingly, in doing this, I found that there are three common attributes for all those advisors that talk to all their clients about their protection needs. And funny enough, they also have a really high mortgage to protection conversion rate. And they are simply enthusiasm, passion and belief. Not just in the need for their clients to protect themselves and their families, but also in the products themselves. And this brings me nicely to my first point. When we get together as an industry at different national conferences, that passion and enthusiasm often seems to be left at the front door. I'm not going to mention names, but I'm sure you can all remember events that you've been to, uh, which have been quite frankly dull. People droning on about what's wrong with our industry, what providers need to do better, what advisors are doing wrong, the issues with this bit of legislation or that product name's wrong without really offering any solutions. In fact, I would suggest it's probably easier to remember those events that stand out as memorable, upbeat, and made you leave them pumped up and wanting to do even more. A couple spring to my mind. Uh, the most recent was the Life Search Awards, which were held just a few months ago. The other one, which was a few years ago now, which was the PFS Financial Festival, which was held at the NEC, they wanted to make it the Glastonbury of the financial services industry. They told everybody to come dressed as they would if they were going to a music festival, and they got all the stand holders and providers to build their stands as though they were going to be out in the field and, and have a bit of fun, be different. Not all managed it, I have to tell you, but it was a really memorable event. I guess all I'm trying to say is that we need to harness that passion, enthusiasm and belief, which is boundless in our industry, and use it at our events. If you've ever been to one of our legal and general sales skills masterclasses, you'd have heard either me or Steve Fallon say we want to make protection sexy. And I still believe that. And if you still think it's a strange word to use, then just look at its meaning up in the dictionary. Its definition is actually to be interesting or appealing excite or intend to excite. And isn't that what we're trying to do with protection? Get our clients excited about protecting themselves. So if you're organizing an event in the next few weeks um, or months uh, and somebody says to you, what do you think good will look like? Just say to them, I want people to walk away and say, that was a really sexy event. It's a tall order I know, but hey, give it a go. My second point is that we all need to stop making excuses for why we don't talk to all of our customers about protection. In my career, I've never heard an advisor say to me, you know what, Rich, I think I talk to my clients far too much about protection. In fact, it's the exact opposite. I know I should talk to my clients more, but, and we just need to remove that but and replace it with, and I will. It makes sense both from a commercial and a duty of care perspective. From a, a duty of care perspective, if you disagree with me, let's just imagine a client walks into your office tomorrow and tells you their partner is unable to work due to illness or injury, or they've got cancer, or they've died. And they say to you, why didn't you talk to us about protecting ourselves against this? Do you think they will accept any of the following reasons as good enough reasons? Oh, I'm really sorry, but that day I was really, really busy with lots of other clients' mortgages and I just didn't have the time. No. The only reason you can give at a moment like that would be, I'm really sorry, but if you remember, we did talk about protecting your income because your ability to earn income is your biggest asset. And the fact that one in two of us are going to get cancer in our lifetime. And although the likelihood of dying during the term of the mortgage is really low, it could happen. But you and your partner declined my advice. I'm really, really sorry. Now, I accept it's not going to make their situation any better. But if you can hand on heart... Say that you could say that to any of your clients that don't have protection. It means that you would have spoken to all your clients about protection and the need for them to cover themselves. And for me, that's our duty of care to our clients honoured. If we just look at it from a commercial perspective, then why aren't we making the most of each and every single client interaction? Simply selling the mortgage and not making any effort to get the clients to consider additional products be it income protection, GI, life or critical illness, it seems to me a huge missed opportunity. When was the last time, for example, you went to a car showroom and the salesperson just showed you the bottom of the range and sold that to you? No, they show you the top of the range and they sell you the dream, the smell of the leather, the sound system, even the metallic paint. Why? Because they're trying to get the best return from each and every sales interaction. I sometimes think we forget that at the end of the day, you're all running businesses and we're in business to be profitable. Yes, it takes a little bit longer, but if the returns per sale are higher, 
then you can afford to see less clients and still earn the same amount. It's simply called working smarter, not harder. This way, the client has uh, been put in a more informed position uh, and can therefore make a more informed decision about what suits them and not maybe what suits the salesperson. And let's hope they never need that wing mirror sensor or the collision avoidance system to avoid crashes. But if they do, then they're going to come back and thank you. It's no different with a mortgage. Let's talk to them about the fully protected mortgage and not just the basic model. And if they ever lose their income, get a critical illness or die, they or their family will thank you for taking that time to give them the benefit of your expert advice and making sure they had a plan B. So remember, make protection sexy, stop making excuses, and let's maximize your profits so that you can hire more salespeople and advise even more clients and at the same time, let's hope none of them ever have to find out about the great things this injury can do in their real moment of need. Thank you very much indeed for listening and take care. Cheers. Well, Richard, thank you so much for that excellent end to the chats this morning. Do you know, I was really impressed to hear from all the young financial services professionals from AIG Life. And isn't it a great air that those seven young people just coming into the industry and then comparing that to the experience of somebody like Richard who's been around for the last 30 years and the fact that a lot of Richard's experience has been built upon sales of mortgage protection I wonder what the experience of those sales those um, professionals at AIG will be over the next 30 years as their career in financial services develops. So before I introduce you to our panel guests today, I'd like to thank all of the speakers who took part in Protect X4. And in order to do that, we're going to do what's known as a thunderclap. Now, if you've watched Protect X before, you'll know how this goes. I know a lot of you have been tweeting already today. I know you've all been using the hashtag ProtectX2021. So what I'd like you to all to do now, as you're watching, is to put in a tweet this minute, just one statement, something you've learned today, something congratulatory, a well done. Pick out a comment that a specific speaker has made in their talk. And I'm going to count down from five to one. And when I get to one, everybody hit the tweet button and Hopefully, that will create a little bit of a ripple in the Twitter sphere, and it maybe just nudges us into the trending zone. So, have you written something down? I'm going to count down now from five to one. Five, four, three, two, one, and hit that tweet button. I can feel the Twitter sphere quaking as those tweets hit it. So I'm delighted now to introduce you to our two panel guests. Please welcome Naomi Gretorex and Tim Smith. Now I'm going to ask each of them to briefly introduce themselves and just say where they come from and what they do. So Naomi, let's go with you first. Hi, good morning, Roger. It's uh, lovely to see you this morning and be invited here to uh, to have a chat with you all. Uh, my name is Naomi Gretorex. My business solutions is a specialist um, protection advisory firm who deals with both business protection and private clients my uh, background is all insurance so I have um, over 20 years of insurance advice advisory experience now and it's lovely to be here and be listening to people talk about protection and be on a panel today thanks Naomi and Tim yeah, hi, it's, uh, it's great to be here today. Uh, I'm Tim Smith, Head of Protection at Hanover Re. Um, so my job basically involves working with uh, a range of insurers to push the protection market forward, help to design um, competitive products that are really appealing uh, to the end consumer. Thanks very much, Tim. Now, the first thing I wanted to look at this morning was this whole idea of getting young people interested in becoming uh, focused in a career in 
the financial services industry in particular, but protection specifically. And, and I actually think about my own experience here. I went to university. I did an economics and marketing degree. I came out of university um, into what I, what was then called the milk round, which was like a, you used to go for loads of job, job interviews. And I wanted to get a job in the marketing department. And to be perfectly honest, at the time, I, I probably didn't care whether it was a marketing department in a fast-moving consumer goods company or, or a financial services company. And as it turned out, the best offer I got was from a financial services firm. So in a way, I got into the financial services and ultimately into the protection industry by accident. I've pretty much stayed given a... a uh, apart from a few years, uh, in and out for now 25 to 30 years. So, so Naomi, first of all, did you get into financial services by accident? And secondly, yeah. what do you think we could be doing more of as an industry to encourage more people like those seven excellent stars from AIG to take up a career in the protection industry? Thanks, Roger. It's really interesting to hear the um, the people talking from AIG, and it's lovely to hear people with such enthusiasm. I um, I went into um, financial services not by mistake, but not having really considered uh, a career in, in in finance. So I finished my degree. Um, I had a, a little girl at the time, and I'd got a job in recruitment, and didn't really like how salesy it was. And um, was flicking through the paper, the local um, Watford Observer, with the, looking at the job pages, and there was an advert for um, a training mortgage advisor with the Abbey. So I applied, went to the interview, got the job, which was great, and did my training. So they paid for me to do my financial exams, um, and it started mortgage advising. Um, I then decided that I wanted to do something more business to business and at the time um abby owned scottish provident went for an interview as a bdm job then and uh, got that job and the rest is i guess history um you know I've, I've worked um nearly 20 years now in the in the financial services market and i've really loved my career you know i've really enjoyed where i've worked i've met some fabulous people um and it's a really fun and interesting place to work i think um, which doesn't sound like it, and I think that's probably the problem. When people think about financial services, they think, goodness, that sounds... And I think one of the um, AIG um, people said, you know, my friends thought it sounded really boring. And I think that's probably the problem with bringing new people into financial services is getting the message out that, you know, it isn't, it's isn't. a really exciting place to work. There's lots of opportunities in uh, financial services, you know, protection industry, there's so many different jobs you can have. Um, and, and it's really, really good place to work, you know, to build a career. And I think really the problem is, I think when you're at school, nobody talks to you about working in financial services, you know, it's, uh, it's not something which people even think about. We don't get sort of financial advice, um, lessons at school, you know, it's not something which is mostly on people's minds. So, I, th I think personally, it's probably up to you know us as an industry to go out and raise the awareness of of the opportunity, possibly even at school level. You know, with these, um, you can you can work with some of these charities now where they will ask ask different industries to go in and and talk to children at you know 11, 12, 13 years old. And I really do think it, it is collectively also up to us to go out and really promote you know the the great industry that we all work in. Thanks, Naomi. Tim, have you got any thoughts on this? Yeah, I mean, so very similar story. It's not like I um, always dreamed of a, a career in financial services. I, I very much sort of fell into it at the end of university, having done a physics degree. Um, I, I think probably one of the issues is that, um, that it's not so tangible when you're at school in terms of the job and what we produce. You know, I guess having the, the subjects I enjoyed at school were more the sort of maths, physics, that sort of side of things. And then a lot of people would talk to you about engineering uh, and jobs like that, where, you know, you can see somebody's designed this bridge or they've designed this power station. There's something very tangible there. And it's very clear what the impact on society is. And I think getting the key is to try and get that across with financial services about sort of what are the benefits of what we do? What are we bringing to society? And what is it you'd be producing effectively with a career 
uh, in this industry. And I think that's probably one of the things that's really missing at the moment with young people sort of promoting the industry. Yeah, and uh, Naomi, you mentioned some of these charities which uh, effectively invite professionals into the classroom to do presentations yes. about about your, your your actual job and your career. Uh, I'm yeah. actually a member of a, a similar charity like that here in Scotland, and I've been into quite a few schools over the last five years. But even I have to admit that when I get invited, I get I tend to get invited to go and talk about marketing. Now, I will talk about marketing from a financial services point of view, but I'm I, I'm not going in there saying a career in financial services is, is what you should aspire to. I'm probably more marketing orientated. So maybe maybe I need to correct myself a little bit, but also encourage other people out there who are watching this to maybe get involved in a similar sort of endeavor. So, t Tim, I was going to come back to you on, on a different subject now. We, we heard from Nick from McKinsey and Company, uh, the fascinating subject of AI, artificial intelligence. And uh, I always think of Skynet and Terminators when, uh, when the, the subject of AI comes up. But Nick had a lot of really interesting stuff to say. But to me, AI sounds potentially complicated and we are an industry that does love its complication we like our products we like our data and i was i was uh, attracted to an article i think it was in the sunday times a couple of m months or so ago and it was about timson's the uh, shoe repair uh, shops that you know you find in most cities in, in the united kingdom and this article was effectively telling how they measure their success, how they measure their profitability, and how they measure their customer service. And whilst it might have sent shivers of horror down a lot of um, people who love technology, they, they're still doing things relatively traditionally. So, you know, they'll email a set of figures at the end of the day. You know, they even send things by snail mail occasionally, which is, which is almost unheard of sometimes. And yet they are very profitable and it works for them. And it just made me think, you know, we're getting access to more and more data through AI or whatever it might be. And with that data comes this feeling that if we can have the data, we've got to use it. Whereas Timpsons was saying, do you know what? You only need to use what you need, not what you can have. So, so Tim, I, I was just wondering from your thoughts uh, maybe with a with a more of a, a mathematical and analytical background, you know, are, are we going to get to the point where we're being given so much data that it effectively becomes analysis paralysis, and we lose sight of the actual benefit that it can bring the customer, as opposed to, you know, actually making it focus on making maybe making things simpler or more efficient. Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting topic, and I think complexity comes up time and again uh, in the industry. And uh, because a lot of our products historically have been quite complex, particularly for the general public to understand, I think I definitely think there is a place for complexity and for complex analysis. Um, there is a lot of data out there, and I think we can use a, a lot of that data to improve the products and improve the pricing. Uh, for consumers uh, and really understand the risks from an insurance company's point of view. Um, but I guess at the same time, we need to sort of whittle down and, and simplify that in some way. And, and I think that's where AI really has the potential in that it's, it's going to be better than, than us at identifying what are the key metrics we should be, uh, we should be tracking. You know, there's no, there's no use driving a business on sort of 150 different metrics and trying to work out if you're optimizing all of them, um, you just, nobody would be able to keep track of it and, and everything would get lost. So you need to identify some simple metrics that are driving your business. And I guess that's exactly what Timpsons are doing. Um, but identifying what those key metrics are is potentially quite a complex task. And then I think the other challenge is really making sure that that complexity doesn't bleed across into say the design of the product. So we heard on the business protection side that that's quite a complex area and some of those um, those products and certainly some of the cu customer needs uh, are very complex and that there's no getting away from that. Business protection uh, customer needs are going to at times be quite complex. But there are a lot of areas of protection where we are sort of crying out for simple products 
uh, that just meet a quite a simple customer need that just you know protect them in the event of their death or protect their families in the event of their death. Um, and and that shouldn't we shouldn't overcomplicate that, and we shouldn't allow all this data that we potentially have to mean that we we build in too many bells and whistles that that do put people off. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it, that as an industry, we're often having conversations at events like this, and and you know, past protection review conferences and protect X's, the subject of complexity keeps coming up. And whilst we do have an, a, a desire to make things simpler for advisors and simpler for end customers, we do seem to be given a lot of shiny new technological toys, which actually enable us to sometimes overly complicate things. Naomi, have you got any thoughts on this from your um, experience working within uh, a product provider in the past? Yeah, it can be. I think the difficulty is you've got um, you've got a lot of insurers in the market, and uh, everybody you know wants to have uh, a unique you know some unique points on on what they offer of the benefits of their products, of why you should use one provider over another, and that is great because you have um, the opportunity then to talk to your clients about lots of different and unique opportunities uh, to have you know add-ons in their policies but also it can make it it can make it confusing um particularly to you know advisors that aren't talking about protection all the time you know i am a protection specialist it's what i talk about all day you know but if you're a mortgage and protection person you've got two 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 sides of the coin to cover and i think sometimes you know there is so much change in in the protection market you know products are you know, you have core products now and, you know, enhanced products with the critical illness and you've got well-being uh, benefits, which are all great. But it can sometimes feel um, quite complicated putting that all into a conversation with, with a client in a really easy to understand way where the client walks away and they understand exactly what each product does, income protection, critical illness, family income benefit, what they do. And they understand it without feeling like, You've just made it more complicated for them, which I think is a, is, is a problem sometimes when we, we're looking at unique ways to stand out. Thanks, Naomi. And and those of you who are watching, do please continue to have the debate on Twitter. Tell us what your thoughts are on how we balance the, the potential complexity that all of this technology is um, potentially going to create against the simplicity that perhaps the end client is looking for. So please do continue the debate on Twitter and don't forget the hashtag ProtectX2021. Now, I'm actually going to put Naomi and Tim on the spot a little bit here. Uh, we did have a pre-meeting, we always do when we uh, have these ProtectX events, to, to discuss some of the questions that we might actually talk about. But today, just to prove that we do accept questions in the course of the program. I have here delivered on my on my phone a question from Graham Simons from Health and Protection magazine. And it's about the recent media article, uh, which actually created a little bit of uh, furore when Christian Ronaldo, he made the headlines for removing Coca-Cola bottles from the table at the Euros press conference. And he said, Effectively, people shouldn't be drinking this. They should be drinking water. And 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 Graham's question is: How important is that benefits provider providers and insurers embed nutrition and well-being to effectively try to change people's habits and behaviours? Is it important that high-profile people like Ronaldo make a stand on the importance of this sort of nutrition and on the subject of health and well-being? And will that help change people's behaviours? And should product providers and financial advisors maybe build that into the protection conversation? So who'd, who'd like to try and go for that first? Tim, maybe? Sure. Yeah. Happy to, to pick that up. Um, yeah. I mean, I think it is important. It's an important element um, of the products we design. Um, and there's a number of benefits to it. You know, if we as a protection industry can promote uh, healthy lifestyles amongst the people we insure, then that benefits them. But it also benefits insurers and ultimately reinsurers like myself in terms of the, the sorts of risks we're running. Um, I think the importance is to make it um, really wide ranging. 
Um, and so I think one of the traps that perhaps the industry has fallen into in the past has been to really focus on sort of fitness uh, as the key measure. And it, that would appeal to, so for example, with uh, with wearable devices and, uh, and devices that measure your step count or how much running you're doing or how often you're going to the gym. And that's all well and good for a particular um, part of society. But, uh, but it won't appeal to, to the majority, I would say. Whereas I think uh, if we can design products that focus much more on sort of holistic health uh, and not just on fitness, um, then I think that will have much broader appeal. Um, and part of that is the sort of um, long-term preventative, you know, encouraging um encouraging her healthy lifestyle. Part of it is also maybe, you know, there are wearable devices getting more and more uh, sophisticated that are able to actually uh, pick up pick up sort of early onset of various diseases long before you might have symptoms that you would notice um, and that could be um, you know I guess people have talked about wearables be becoming a big thing in the future in, in the industry and that for me is is where it's going to start to really appeal to the mass market if you can start to have some use cases where oh well this person got diagnosed with x um, you know five months before they would have been because of this wearable device because that was provided by their by their life insurer or something so that feels um, that that's where there's really potential for that sort of technology um, and and that should benefit consumers uh, and the industry itself I think that the subject of of health fitness mental health and well-being has really come to the forefront during the, the covid pandemic I think quite rightly we should probably have been talking about it long before covid but it certainly focused our attention and 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 there's been some very good conversations had at, at events like this and other events throughout the industry about the importance of a focus on mental health it just makes me wonder though because we hear quite a lot of talk about well we'll never go back to full-time office working you know people will want to continue to work from home and, and that's fine that, that that's that's great and, and maybe people We'll, we'll get a choice going forward. But then I'm also hearing, you know, that now that we have got Zoom and Teams and, and all of this video technology, that people are spending more time in meetings than they've ever spent. In fact, I was talking to a lady yesterday who said, I literally get up and sit in front of my computer and it's end one meeting and start the next to the extent that she'd actually have to go out and buy a coffee machine for her office in, in her home because she hasn't got time in between meetings to nip downstairs to the kitchen to make one. And it just made me wonder whether we, we will still be able to get the health and mental health balance right, even if we do enter this new world that uh, potentially stretches us ahead of us. Naomi, what are your thoughts on this subject of health and fitness and well-being? Yeah, I think it's uh, it's really interesting, isn't it? Because it is definitely at the moment a really hot topic because of uh, COVID and because of you know the pressures on people's mental health. Um, it's been great to see, although I've spoken about complexity, it's been great to see the insurance companies looking at um, health and wellness and the support um, benefits that they can offer within within certain contracts. So you've seen a real rise in that, I think, in the last twelve months of insurance companies coming out and um, producing, you know, support uh, for um, for their members. Maybe if, you know, doesn't need to be a claim, you can use it at any point. And that's given access to all sorts of things with uh, with some of the providers. So, you know, mental wellness, you know, um, access to physio, GPs, et cetera. And I think that's been a really important thing. It's also been great to see, and just touching on the group market for businesses, um, a support there and I think that's really important that we get out and talk to businesses small businesses particularly about um, the support that group um, group insurers uh, can give them with regards to supporting their employees both health and wellness options because there's been a, a real improvement I think of that in the group market and I think it's a really good way for um, business owners to be able to offer their employees something extra. Thanks Naomi. One of the other subjects I wanted to touch upon was um, something that uh, Bipon said in his talk about COVID testing. Uh, now, I thought Bipon's talk was extremely frank, 
uh you know it, it, there was no beating about the bush he told us as it was and it was the truth rather than the spin that we often hear from the mainstream media and, and, and perhaps from the government but what it did make me think about was you know this age old issue that we've had in the protection industry of the public don't actually believe some of the um positive things about the industry so whilst we pay over 99 percent of our claims the public still believe that the industry doesn't pay claims now whilst that is a situation which has improved massively over the last decade there are still people out there who distrust financial services and i guess the whole social media environment that we're in the, the way that the mainstream media works it's a sort of sound box isn't it uh, you, you you're trapped in a bubble sometimes listening to people who have the same view as you so if you don't believe that the insurance industry pays out claims then it's likely that you've got people who will agree with you and it's likely that you'll go online and look for articles that prove that you're right as opposed to finding articles and, and statistics that prove that you're wrong and what Bipon's saying is that you know this is the truth but a lot of people don't know what the truth about covid testing is because they're hearing the spun version do you think there's anything more we can be doing as an industry to really push the positive messages in front of more people you know the fact that we do pay out a massive amount of claims the fact that we are using added value services that you mentioned there naomi and the, and and tim to help people not only financially but also emotionally and practically is there more that we can be doing to promote these positive messages naomi what do you think i actually think it's our responsibility to um to make sure that our message gets to the end consumer i really do i think it's it's great for us all to talk in the industry about what's good what's good. But the important thing is that the, the consumer has a good understanding so I think really it's about getting more involved, which I've done in, in your local uh, community and financial services. I've um, been working with a, a group called the Ladies Finance Club, which is talking to women about the importance of financial services and accessing proper financial advice. By getting all of us going out and getting more involved in um, events or, or, you know, networking opportunities to go out and talk at, you know, somebody's because lots happening at the moment with, um, you know, a rise in people wanting to access financial advice. And there's lots more of these networking groups going on locally. And I think from an advisor's perspective, it's, it's a really good opportunity to go out and meet new people. So I would say, really, it's about us, you know, going out and networking and getting the message out there. Positive messages, absolutely. And messages. Tim, what do you think? Any anything from from your side? Yeah, I mean, I think it's great that we're publishing these stats now, uh, and I think that does um, does ring true with some people. But as you say, people will sort of look for things that reinforce their own story and their own narrative. Uh, and I guess, yeah, statistics. People sort of are, have a suspicion of statistics that, in some way, they're going to be. Um, manipulated so i think that's probably although it's a step forward i think that's the challenge that we have with just publishing those um i think sort of personal stories uh have a lot much more resonance with people so if we can sort of really promote uh personal stories where the industry has really helped people you know somebody that has contracted a critical illness and actually found it extremely easy to claim because uh, and, it, and it gave them money at their time of need and sort of explaining exactly how they uh, how that helped them in that situation. Those sorts of personal stories, I think, is probably going to be a lot more. Uh, it's going to resonate a lot more with with the general public than than these statistics, unfortunately. Yeah, there was a there was a great article uh, Jeff Prestridge wrote. Uh, I think it was last week or the week before where he was actually having a pop at the banks as he often does uh, and the, the great thing about this article was that he was using the protection industry almost like as a, a beacon an example of how to do it right and you know 10 years ago that would have been almost unheard of but this industry really is doing great things and it's good when you can get somebody um, of Jeff's caliber behind the industry and, and and promoting those positive stories i just guess that we 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 need more of those now 
as always, time flies by when we're having these little debates following Protect X sessions. So I'm going to start to draw things to a close at the moment, but I didn't want to finish off until we had a little bit of a chat about business protection. Uh, great presentation from Zanel before. And again, qu quite staggering the fact that, you know, it's it's obvious that so many businesses have been taking out the loans that the government have been offering and guaranteeing in order to help businesses uh, survive the, the pandemic. And yet there hasn't been that corresponding increase in business loans. And we've talked many times about business protection being complicated. Is this just another case where signposting becomes very important? So in the same way as you might have a wealth advisor who it's, it, protection isn't their special, specialism, but they maybe have a duty to signpost to a, a protection specialist. Do we just need to make sure there's a bit more of that going on from a business point of view? Um, and maybe that's something that we haven't been as strong at as we should have been. What do you think, Naomi? Yeah, it's clear. Um, it's clear that that is that should be the message signposting, um, and that came out very clearly. I thought in the presentation. You know, there are a network of people that can help um, clients access advice, and if you don't want to or can't write the business yourself, you should refer it. And we've seen a lot in the market. I think at the moment, people talking about write it yourself or refer it. And business protection is 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 a key area where people can think if you don't. If you don't, if you're not used to talking about business protection, you don't do it often. It can seem more of a daunting experience to have a conversation with a business owner about more complex, you know, problems. So I definitely think there is a massive opportunity there. And I think actually that with um, the rise of loans, certainly the civil loans, where people have been taking personal guarantees, it's really important that these people get proper financial advice and understand the protection available. Tim. I mean, I completely agree. I think probably one of the challenges is that it is a complex area and it is complex to uh, fully assess the needs uh, of a business in some cases. But then equally, there's probably a case to be said that some protection is better than none. Uh, and if you can put some business protection in place, then that will put that company in a better position uh, in the future should should they need it. So, you know, I think uh, I think it's probably about you know, again, a marketing message around uh, the benefits that this brings um, and that it's sort of almost the responsible thing to do as a business owner um, in terms of your governance of your business to make sure that you've got this protection in place. Fantastic. So we are almost at the end of our time. Uh, before we go, I'd just like to invite Naomi and Tim to give us a quick 30 second wish or 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 prediction for the protection market in the next year or so as we finally emerge from the covid pandemic hopefully uh, beyond the night whatever the date is now the 19th of july where do you th what do you think is going to happen next naomi goodness well um I would like to see, uh, you know, a rise in protection conversations happening. There's, uh, I think the mortgage market's going to quieten down a little bit now because obviously we're coming out of the stamp duty, uh, you know, discount. And I think maybe that will give uh, mortgage advisors, you know, more time to focus as well on the protection side. So it'd be good to see sort of towards the second half of the year, um, you know, that, that um, increase coming through on the uh, protection advice where you've previously given mortgage mortgage advice with mortgage and protection brokers. And Tim? Yeah, I mean, the theme of communication came up again and again and again throughout that, uh, throughout the talks, I thought. Um, so, you know, through Bipon's talk on the lack of understanding of these lateral flow tests, uh, Matthew talking about how important it is that we just have these conversations about social care. Um, and, and it came out in, in other talks as well. And I just think, yeah, increasing the amount of communication we have across the industry and the effectiveness of that. And and then it comes back to simplicity as well. Simplifying the message as much as possible uh, for the end consumer uh, is, is what I'd like to see more of. Great. Naomi, Tim, thank you so much for joining me here live today on Protect X4. And I'd like to finish again by thanking all of the speakers thank you for the time you took putting your presentation to together today great conversations quite 
in-depth and hot topics. Really enjoyed the debate, really enjoyed seeing the reactions on Twitter. Do please continue to have conversations on Twitter after the event finishes, and do please continue to use the hashtag ProtectX2021. It's good to see the conversation continue. Also mm -hmm. like to thank once again our event partners for your support of ProtectX4 today. There is going to be a ProtectX5 that will be in September, and we might actually have a slight in-person element to that as well, uh, but the main event will be online and hopefully in December we'll be able to get back to the landmark and actually see you all in person for some more talks, some awards and hopefully some dinner and some wine. So thanks for watching Protect X4 and I hope you have a great day ahead.